Welcome. Today we're going to be talking about civilization. Why some civilizations will take off like a rocket ship and why others might remain more stagnant. Now, this is something not talked about in school. The reason why is rather simple. It can be a potentially racially sensitive topic. However, when we don't talk about these things, right, people seek their answers on the internet, right? They seek alternative explanations because academia gives no explanation. When that occurs, people can fall uh, for racist rhetoric or racial theory or uh, aliens, ancient alien stuff, um, as in, you know, ancient aliens bl uh, bred with them and created this DNA that did all these things and they're technologically superior but are also like not human or were bred via giants or troglodytes or, or, or this race was blessed by the gods while the others weren't. All sorts of crazy nonsense has been used by both white and black supremacists um, over the last few centuries for, for this. So it's important we look at it today and offer the real explanation, right? It's, just, it's not ancient aliens. It's not anything racist occurring here. It's geographical, right? And it's, it's, um, it, it's uh, areas where partnerships can occur to contribute to um, a, a, an explosion in technology and exchange in ideas. Uh, Herodotus describes the Greeks as frogs around a pond, all right? And so um, we're going to take a look at the frog pond here, the original frog pond in the Mediterranean Sea. Look at all these frogs, right, around a pond. Um, we're going to start with the Middle East, though, because that's where it begins. Here we have in this area Ur, Sumer, Babylon, to the north, Assyria, to the right, Persia, to the left, Phoenicia, the Hebrews, the north, the Hittites, and, and to the west, uh, the Egyptians. All of these people are connected, right? They are one, the Assyrians are not one civilization, but many civilizations when it, 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 it comes to technology and exchange and information, right? We see here on the Mediterranean, the frog pond, it's the itself that Herodotus was referring to. Syracuse, Rome, Carthage, they're all in a trading triangle with each other. The Greeks are trading with the Cretans. Um, they're trading with Rhodes, Halicarnassus, Troy, Egypt, Phoenicia, the Hebrews, the Hittites, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, etc., right? And then they even have their own trading triangle here in, in Greece itself with, you know, the Athenians, the Corinthians, the Thebans, um, Argos, Athens, Sparta, um, Ephesus. All these city-states are all interacting and trading with each other. They're exchanging new, fresh ideas um, constantly with each other. So in this way, we don't have the Greeks aren't a civilization in this sense the Assyrians aren't a super civilization. The Phoenicians aren't a civilization. What they are together is one super civilization because when it comes to technological advancement and advancement in any form, in any ideological idea or philosophical idea, including technological, all of these people are connected, right? So if someone in Babylon, let's say, invents the mirror, the mirror quickly goes to Persia, to Assyria, to Phoenicia, to the Hebrews, the Egyptians, the Greeks, right? Everybody gets the mirror. You're not relying on just one smart person of your particular people. You're getting information from the smart people of all the civilizations next to you. And when it comes to these frogs on the pond, we have a ton of different people with very different ideas that are all being spread out around. The other thing occurring, because they are on a pond or a sea, if you will, is that the seas are the highways. They are the interstates of the ancient world, right? The travel, trade, and especially, most importantly, information can be exchanged so quickly via the sea. 
While as if you have to go by land, it's the equivalent of, of going 70 miles an hour on an interstate to all of a sudden having to be only go able to go five miles per hour on a dirt or gravel road, right? The exchange of information is slowed greatly. When we look at Nubia here, which is our an African civilization, right? How are they connected to this frog pond? Well, they aren't really. Who they're connected to is the Egyptians, right? And Egypt kind of blocks their passage from being able to connect to the other peoples, right? They're landlocked. We think of Africa in general, and a lot of these other places, Africa, North America, South America, they have these giant, gigantic continental masses. And um, so they don't have the, the luxury of having exchange via sea, right? They're not able to get on the highway. They have to go on these dirt roads, right? These gravel roads that take a really long time um, to exchange and trade, etc., Right? So Nubia is locked out of this. So they're not going to get the, all the benefits that everybody else is um, from this geographical, geographical positioning. Right? And neither are any of the other African civilizations or, or even you know, North American or South American. Right? They're, not, they're not connected to the, the, uh, these geographical centers of explosion when it comes to technology right? and thinking. All right? Um, so while these areas, right, are, are like the Nubians in, in the Kingdom of Aksum and Great Zimbabwe, those are people which in a way is even more remarkable because they're coming up with civilization on their own. They're not sharing ideas with so many people as they are coming up with it on their own, which in a way is an even bigger accomplishment, right? When we talk about... Um, the Greeks, right? You can say, well, the Greeks, they did all these amazing things. They, they did this and that and this and that. Yes, they did. The Greeks were an amazing people, but they didn't do it on their own. You are correct. It's impossible for any one people to do these things. They're not just doing it, right? They're taking, they're borrowing from the Phoenicians, the Hebrews, the Egyptians, the Carthaginians, the Hittites, the Persians, the Babylonians, all these people are connected and they're doing it together to advance, right? To advance technologically. So that's why we see explosions like this occur. They're not going it alone, right? They're having a lot of help and that help is not from God or the gods, right? And that help is not from ancient aliens, right? The help is from the Persians and the Egyptians and etc. And you get the idea. They are, they are having assistance, but it's not from aliens or gods. It's from the, the people around them. We look at Asia, another place that really takes off. We can see quickly here Korea, Japan, and China in this trading triangle here. They're all interconnected by this, the, this inland sea where they can quickly send ships back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The exchange of information is happening rapidly, right? Rapidly. And very quickly. So you can see the, the immense technological and philosophical progress taking place there. And that is, it's no surprise due to this geographical positioning that they are the ones leading Asia in these categories throughout most of, most of history. But you also have other civilizations nearby, Chimer, right, or later Siam, as well as numerous empires that existed over the millennia in Indonesia, as well as in India. And they're all able to get on the uh, on on this train here via their connection with China and Japan. But also interestingly, you see the per Silk Road here as well. Persia, right? Uh, China, India, Persia, all the way to the Greeks in the Mediterranean, right? There's this the Silk Road. Now it's a very slow moving dirt road, right? That's going all the way from Asia all the way to Europe, right? Uh, through the Middle East to Europe, and it is going very slowly, but ideas from the Greeks are reaching people in China. Ideas from China are reaching people in Greece, albeit very slowly. When we look at our next part, uh, the Renaissance, right, the Renaissance, um, in, the, uh, in Europe, <clears throat> we see here the Mediterranean, the frogs on the pond, the OG frogs, they're still there. We still have uh, 
they're still there, although in different uh, capacities, by different names. Milan, Genoa, Venice, Florence, Rome, Naples, uh, Athens, Byzantium. They're all connected in this area, and they're all trading amongst each other. And that's where civilization is really flourishing throughout the Middle Ages. We look here to um, where it really takes off in the late Renaissance and the Imperial era. We look at Great Britain here, and then we have Holland, France, Portugal, and Spain. They're all connected in this very tight-knit area. And that's important. They're connected by an, a sea in a very tight-knit area. So information is being able to be exchanged very, very, very quickly. When we look at the people who would go on to you know, conquer the, the world, more or less, it's, the, it's because of this technological process that's occurring at a very vast rate um, in Holland, France, and Britain, and Spain, and Portugal, right? And they're able to exchange information very quickly amongst each other. Um, and you can see here, Germany is also, they're progressing, but not at the same rate that the, the British and the French and, and, and the others are, right? And that's because they're more landlocked, right? They don't, they're not, they, they're not able to access this epicenter that is the English Channel, right? They don't have access to that. So they are progressing, but more slowly uh, than others, than, than the major powers. <clears throat> but let's think about this for a minute, right? Because it's not just the geographical positioning. It's the existence of having neighbors in close proximity to them that they're able to succeed. When we look at the Greeks, Right? We see Corinth, Athens, Sparta, uh, you know, all, all these places, Thebes, Argos. We have all these little city-states on this one little peninsula. And they're all trading and interacting with each other and exchanging ideas. They all have different ideas on equality and how governments should be run and different ideas on art and technology. They're all being exchanged amongst each other, right? How imaginative those Greeks were when they were divided and how quickly that creativity, that imagination, that technological prog uh, progress was stymied when they were united, right? When, when Macedon conquers and unites the Greeks under Philip the Cyclops, where, did all, where does all that inventiveness go? Well, it ends, right? The period of the golden age of the Greeks has ended their success was in their failure to conquer each other, right? Which allowed them to have all these different people groups with all these different ideas that could all exchange information with each other, all right? For an example, let's just say there's, there's a kingdom A in Africa and there's a kingdom B and a kingdom C and they're all in a triangle together of trade and of information. Let's say Kingdom A conquers Kingdom B and Kingdom C. What, and unites them. What happens then? Well, stagnation, right? Because, because they're, they no longer have allies or other peoples with different ideas in close proximity to them to bounce things off of, right? And so, so in that scenario, their success is actually their failure, right? When we look at the Greeks, their lack of success in conquering each other is their success. That's what brings about the golden age there. So folks, I hope this, I hope this gives you an idea of, um, of some of the things. Now, obviously it's perfectly, uh, people are perfectly capable of making a civilization outside of, of trading triangles and geographical position. We see that throughout Africa, right? We see that through in North America and South America and Central America, right? With, with civilizations such as Cahokia or the Mississippian culture or the Aztecs or the Incans or the, or the, uh, the Mayans, right? When we look at the poor Aztecs, where's their next nearest civilization at the time they're existing to bounce their ideas off of? Well, it's Peru. Right? It's a, that's a very, very long way away. So while there are tribes and conglomerates of tribes for them to bounce their ideas off with, there's no, no other civilization nearby for them to do that. And so their progress can only occur so quickly under such circumstances, right? 
Um, so I hope you see by, by just looking, taking a simple look at the maps, right, of the geography, um, that we have a very logical and reasonable explanation for why things are occurring in certain places, right? It's not due to God's blessing one race of people or, or cursing certain people, right? Or, and it's not due to aliens blessing certain people or, or, or whatever, right? This comes from theozoology, right? Theozoology is the work uh, of Lars Liebenfels, okay? Lars Liebenfels was a very insane German man who helped pioneer Nazism in Germany, right? Yes, he believed in the superiority of certain races over others and that ancient aliens had something to do with that. Be very careful, folks, about people talking about ancient aliens, okay? And I say this, it's all fun and games, but there are people who are racial theorists and racists who have been talking about ancient aliens and trying to, to warp that into racist idealization, right? For a very long time since the Nazis, and they are still around today, and they are still very willing to corrupt your mind with nonsense, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, keep that in mind that there are uh, nefarious and, and malevolent individuals who are going to try to corrupt your brain out there when it comes to ideas on race, okay? So stay away from that. Um, we've presented a very logical explanation as why things are occurring, uh, and I do hope it helps and answers some questions for you as to why uh, certain things may have occurred somewhere as opposed to not in other places. All right, folks, thank you so much for watching. If you have comments, if you have questions about any of this, please uh, please feel, feel free to comment. Uh, keep, it, keep it PC, right? Uh, but feel free to comment. And yes, uh, domestication of animals, horses, or even having horses in certain areas definitely helps speed up um, uh, civilization. So th that's also part of the puzzle. Thanks for watching, guys, and I hope you enjoyed it.